I think we are live. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you're doing great. Thanks for joining me and uh, our guest instructors this week. We are um, the second day of this uh, summer workshop, free workshops this summer. And uh, super excited about today's session. So yesterday, if you missed it, I had my friend uh, Jesse here in the studio. And you can rewatch that, um, whether you're on YouTube. Or, well, actually, it is hosted on YouTube. But if you're part of the private community, you can also access that if you want. Um, for those of you watching on Facebook, hello, welcome. Um, I will be taking some questions. Well, Steve and I will be taking some questions live. So if you have any questions, I'll be monitoring the, the chat room here. And you can ask your questions in Facebook or YouTube. And those of you who are watching in the Guitar Playback Private Community, um, you can actually click on that video. What you're watching right now is an embed from YouTube. So you can just click on the, the top left, wherever the title is on that video. That'll bring you straight to YouTube. And if you are, I believe you need to be logged in. Um, but if you are, feel free to interact in the chat. I'll be taking some questions. And um, everybody's welcome. So keep it. Uh, Keep it cool. I know you all well. Keep it family friendly. I know you all well. And um, yeah, so th this workshop will last about an hour. I'll be taking some questions. Um, I have my good friend Steve in the back end. And unfortunately, um, I'm still having some delay issues, which means that I'm probably not going to interact with Steve too much because uh, you're going to hear a bad delay. He hears it, um, and you guys are going to hear it too. But that being said, I'm going to bring Steve on. I might be a little bit quiet, um, and I might interject if, uh, if you guys need anything. Steve, are you ready? Yep. OK. All right. Um, without further ado, everyone, here is my good friend, Steve Stein. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to log off because of the delay, but uh, the, the room is yours, man. All right. All right. All right. Awesome. All right, so yes, we are live. Thank you, David. Um, I always love working with David. He's, he's a, a super great player, but more importantly, he's a super great guy. Uh, so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about trying to um, convert what you know on the fretboard to sound a little more like an authentic solo. And uh, there's a lot of things that I think about that go into that. Uh, hey, Gavin, at, that I think are important for people to think about. Like when I when I think about when I was younger and I was learning how to play, I was so into learning scales and working on technique, and I'm glad I did all that stuff for sure. But there are a lot of things that you can do in just changing your mindset a little bit that can make what you already know sound more authentic, sound more like real solos and not just playing scales or not just moving around you know, a position, which I used to do a lot. You know, I'd learn a, a spot on the guitar, and I'd be practicing – and I, I, I wasn't really interacting with the music. I was kind of playing over the music. And I'll tell you this. One of the most important things that I can say to you is if you want to keep moving on this guitar journey and you want to get better, you got to be honest with yourself. That's one of the most important things. <laughs> I feel like you're calling me out, Steve, Shea says. You know, that's, that's one of the big things is, is um, being honest. So it's less about the people that you might, that might be hearing you. And it's less about, you know, it's, it's more about you and making that authentic connection. And again, I don't want to waste your time just talking, but I remember being a kid and playing Iron Maiden songs and Metallica songs. And this would have been back in the early eighties. And my friends would come over and hear me. And even if I made mistakes and stuff, I honestly am not sure that they even noticed. But the big thing was, is I, I could tell when I wasn't locked in. And I remember when I, when I started playing and I really started experiencing locking into the songs and really playing those songs and, and feeling like I was part of the song. And it was so exciting for me. And of course, it, it made me want to play even more. And, you know, I still practice every day, even, even today. Um, yesterday, I turned 53 and I still practice every single day. I started playing when I was 13. So that's what I want to talk to you about is just some things to think about. So the first thing I've got on my list here is 
the fretboard. Now, you might, and, and you can certainly, I can see the chat here, so we can talk about this, but knowing confidently your fretboard, being able to look down at your fretboard and see what you want. Let's say, let's just start with something simple. Let's just say we're playing pentatonic, you know, A minor pentatonic, and we'll move into diatonic and wherever it is you want to go is perfectly fine. But let's just start with something simple. So when I look down at my fretboard, I either can absolutely see what I'm trying to see, or I can see segments. I always call it playing with blinders on. Like when we learn how to play, a lot of times we'll learn how to play a scale and we'll go, you know, we'll practice the scale, which is very important to do. But then we'll move to the second position, for instance. And sometimes what happens is people will have blinders on. So when they're playing in that first position, they can see it like blinders, like you put on a horse, right? So they don't, they don't look around. They just look forward. And then you move to the second position. And the only way you can do that is by moving over like this. And now you can't see the first position. And so one thing that's really, really important is not just to practice these scales in a rudimentary sense, but really trying to get used to being able to play them in a more creative sense, which is the next thing I'm going to get into. So the first thing I want to do here is just get you to understand that if you feel like, and we're, we're all up against a wall, every guitar player on the planet, I don't care if you're Steve Vai, there's something, there's a wall somewhere and you got to find a way through that. So with this honesty thing I was talking about, what you need to do is you need to be able to look at your guitar with whatever scale, whatever key that you're working with and start trying to figure out how to own that visualization, okay? Because if you can't see it, you're not going to be able to utilize it, certainly in an in, 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 in improvisation scenario, right? If you can't see it, especially if you get a little nervous, it's going to go away. So you want to own that. You want to own what you're trying to visualize. That's the first thing. So let's say, for instance, you start learning how to play, again, A minor pentatonic. Just apply it to wherever you are, okay? You know, wherever it is that you want to go, again, within the context of that scale, that key. And the other thing I would definitely... Again, we're going to get into the soloing part, but I just want to preface some of these things. The other thing is, is don't think that all keys and all scales are created equal because they're not. I mean, if you're a jazz player, you might play in B flat a lot. If you're a rock player, you're going to play in A a lot or E a lot, right? So be aware of the keys that you find yourself playing in a lot. Beware of the scales that meet you where you are right? A lot of people will go, well, I got to learn my modes because there's more notes and that's great. And, and you should learn those if you want to learn those. But if you haven't dialed in your pentatonics yet, don't undervalue the pentatonic scale in the, the amount of wonderful things that you can do with it. Because diatonic scales are just a pentatonic scale with a couple more notes, right? That pentatonic framework will always be there, no matter what kind of player you are, no matter how good you get, that pentatonic framework is going to be there. You just start adding more things on top of it, you see? So that visualization, and hopefully that makes sense. I want you to really start thinking about that. So you might ask, your, you know, think to yourself, maybe I need to learn another position, right? Or maybe I need to learn how to move between the positions that I have. Or maybe I need to learn to visualize that better. Because every time I go to jam, I kind of get stuck every time I go to this one spot, right? So that's something to think about a little bit is what's the best way of approaching this for you to be able to connect that fretboard in your mind, okay? So that's one thing. The second thing is, is learning how to execute what you are seeing, okay? So, and again, I'm not saying that you have to learn the whole fretboard. All of this stuff has to be done in a timely manner that makes sense to you. If you only know one position, everything that we're talking about today, you could apply to that one position. You can still get better at seeing that position, right? or you might decide you need a second position or whatever it might be, okay? So the second thing is, is execution. So first thing is visualization. Second thing is execution. Your ability to manipulate and maneuver or drive through this scale or this position, right? So if you go, let's say I'm playing um, this A minor pentatonic and I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. 
So now all of a sudden I, I'm moving and that's wonderful. And I'm picking and I'm working on all kinds of different techniques, but we're talking about trying to connect to the music here. Okay. So one thing that I want to start thinking about is my ability to manipulate this scale in a way that might be more musical, maybe not in the beginning, but certainly as I keep going. So I could use scalar movements, no doubt about it. You know, that sort of thing. But another thing to really start practicing is your ability of being able to jump over strings or slide to another position or slide to a note. Other, And again, we'll talk more about all of these things as we keep going here. But if I took that pentatonic scale right there, and you start training yourself to be able to move, I've always called this meandering, but move in a free sense. So your pick and your fingers are able to adjust as needed. So it's not that everything needs to be a sequential movement up or down. It can move around. You can jump all over the place. And sometimes what happens, we can call these intervallic movements where we're not just going step by step, right? So what happens sometimes is with that, we get these interesting sounds. And I don't want you to look at this as moving in thirds or moving in fourths. Let's not worry about all that right now. Let's just think not playing sequentially all the time. Okay. There's no nevers in guitar playing. There's just what else can I do that might be a little more interesting. So as I start jumping around, I can start coming up with something a little bit different. And it's also showing me on a technical sense that as I'm doing something that's out of the ordinary, my hands are able to respond. Now, you can look this up on you know YouTube or whatever where I talk about meandering, but basically if you set a metronome and you start going dun 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 dun, you can start training yourself. to see how long you can go without stopping through this position and train yourself to do this over and over and over without stopping. Now, again, we're not to music yet, but we're learning how to execute across the fretboard. Now, maybe you're already really good at that, but you're now learning how to play the second position or something like that, right? So you could take this idea and you could move it into the second position. And maybe you start attaching those two positions together. Now, remember, you're not looking for perfection here, and this isn't a musical thing right now. What we're trying to do is execute what we're seeing. We're visualizing a position, two positions, whatever it might be, okay? And as we're seeing those positions, now what we're doing is we're trying to execute across the fretboard within the parameters of these positions to see how well we can do this. OK, so that's another thing that you really want to start learning how to do, because, again, at the end of the day, the more control you have of your fretboard. Now, we haven't gotten to the musicality yet, but the more control you have of the fretboard, your ability to see it and your ability to move within the parameters of what you see, the more opportunities you have. And again, I don't mean to say this over and over and over, but that doesn't mean, OK, I'm going to lock myself in a room and just practice all five positions for the next year. No, no, no. There's all kinds of other things you want to work on to make these things sound more musical while you're learning those positions. Okay. So a little bit of, of everything is a really important thing to do. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense so far. The next thing we want to do is we want to start talking about some creatives. Okay. So we had visualization, we have execution. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to move into creatives. Now creatives for me are the really powerful. This is where you start thinking about how the sound of what you're doing, the um, execution of a particular idea. So let's say I go in there and I've got my A minor pentatonic. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that when I'm picking, I can pick louder and softer in different places. And I know you know that, but you really want to start thinking about that. You see? So if I was doing... Um Right? 
I'm playing Little Wing or something like that. And then it gets to the solo and I'm thinking about... Right? So I'm thinking about the key of E now. Yeah, I can turn up just a little bit here for you. Okay? So as I'm playing... I'm going to be in the key of E, but you get the idea. So I'm thinking about Little Wing and the band's playing, right? Or the jam track's playing, whatever situation you're in. And the music's really quiet. So I don't want to come out, you know, I'm not there yet, okay? I'm thinking about dynamics. I'm thinking about creative. So the music's playing, the band's playing kind of quiet, and I'm... playing soft playing loud, using my pick however I like, okay? So creative is the first thing, dynamics. Now, the other thing to think about is your toggle switch, which makes a huge difference in the sounds that you're creating, okay? If I go all the way to the bottom, I have this kind of nasally tone, especially when it's cleaner like this. And if I go all the way up, I have this really beefy sound. And then anywhere in between is going to be a little bit thinner than those. So at this point, what I'm doing is I'm listening and I'm connecting to what I'm hearing. Okay, I've been studying my fretboard. I've been studying in this key. I'm learning to visualize whatever. And now the music is starting. And the first thing I think to myself is, what key am I in? What scale option or options do I have? What tempo is this at? And what does that tell me about what I'm going to do, how I'm going to approach this? Okay? And I think about this every single time. I'm sure David does the same thing. You have to think about that. What key am I in? What do I know about this key? What scales am I going to use? What tempo am I at? If the song is really fast... I'm going to have a harder time trying to utilize maybe some of my licks and things unless I'm really up on those, right? If it's at a slower tempo, like let's say Little Wing, I have more freedom to play in a groove sense, in a free sense, right? As I'm playing. Whatever it is, okay? So... Understanding that you have control over dynamics by the way that you're picking. You also have control of your tone by simply changing the toggle switch if you have more than one pickup and certainly your volume knob. And if you, you know, I can't speak for David, but for me, like when I play, you'll see me adjusting those things all the time, you know, unless I'm playing Slayer or something like that, then I'm, I'm certainly not. But if I'm playing, you know, anything that has dynamic element, I'm always adjusting those and trying to kind of listen to the music and make a connection to that music. So it's not just setting my, 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 you know, pick up in a particular spot and then I'm done. It's always trying to kind of figure out kind of where I want to be with that. Okay. So dealing with volume and tone dynamics. Okay. The next thing that I think about, and I'm not, not sure if you'll get something with all of these notes. I can certainly give them to David and he can send them to you too. But the next thing I, I talk about a lot with students is dynamic contrast. So what you're doing in dynamic contrast is you're thinking about low versus high, fast versus slow, a lot versus a little, pentatonic versus diatonic, playing versus not playing, right? Making it interesting for the listener so you're not just doing the same thing over and over and over because what happens a lot is we adopt as guitar players, what I always call the guitar brain. And what the guitar brain is, is there's a million things going on inside here that the listener does not know, right? We are going a thousand miles an hour in here and we're thinking about what we practiced yesterday. And we think about what we were working on for this lick and whatever, all these things are going on. And kind of the, the big thing with learning how to solo effectively is learning to slow down that guitar brain and be in the moment with the music that you're playing along with, okay? So the nice thing with dynamics is it's an easy way of thinking about making something stand out, okay? So I'm going to go back to A minor pentatonic just so we're in the, in the same area here. So I'm back on A minor pentatonic. And let's say, for instance, you were going to play something 
where you're down here. And then you go up. See, now that's going to stand out. So one way that you can look at your fretboard, either moving this direction or certainly look, moving this direction, is think about how when you're in the lower area, lower register of the guitar, you can play more like you're kind of talking quietly or whispering to somebody, right? So when you're down here, and when you get in here, you know, you might move up here. Now you're kind of singing and that could be here too. And that's kind of your singing area. So your talking area and your singing area. And then when you come up here, that's where you start screaming, right? Or singing really loudly to somebody. And so as you're listening to this music, and let's go back to the little wing scenario. So it starts off and it's really quiet. I don't want to start up here. I want to build into that. So with dynamic contrast, I want to start lower. Whether I'm doing it really quiet, or maybe I'm up in here. Right? And I'm doing something there. So dynamic contrast. If you find yourself playing a lot, start trying to figure out how to play a lot, like a bunch of notes or whatever you're doing, and then play a little bit. Okay? Or if you're playing really loud, lower your volume down. Like just always be thinking about contrast. Um, there's a jazz guitar player. His name is Julian Coriel. He's actually Larry Coriel's son. And Julian is a super, super, super awesome, sweet guy. And I was out for lunch with him one time. And uh, I said, so what's going on in your mind when you're improvising? And he said, the main thing I think about is if I recognize I've been doing something, chances are I've been doing it too long. That's what he said to me. And I've, it's always stuck with me because I interpreted that as what I'm telling you right now. If I recognize that I've been doing something, chances are I've been doing it too long and I should probably change it up. Okay. So think about that a little bit as you're going through these things. Okay. So now we'll get to the kind of the meat of making your solo work. So the next thing I've got on the list is phrasing. So once you've really started studying and executing through the position that you're working on or a couple positions or whatever it is that you're doing. You can see it and you've been practicing and meandering and whatever it is that you're doing. The next thing is, is to start thinking about phrasing. And phrasing is basically what I'm doing right now is I talk to you. And it's, it's an automated thing for you know people like David and I who talk all the time. So you start learning how to not you know do Bueller, 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 or you're doing the same thing over and over and over. And with phrasing, you're trying to do exactly that. You're trying to listen to the music and you're trying to speak or sing along with the music with the rhythm, not the pitches, but the rhythms that you're utilizing, right? So as you're playing and you're thinking, okay. So if I play a little bit, I'm going to stop. If I'm listening to, let's say we've got a rhythm going. Let's say we've got something. I'm going to go back to E minor just for a second here. So let's say I'm going. So you've got. Right? All of these things that you could be doing. So instead of playing da 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 right that sort of thing you're thinking about da do da 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 it's almost like scat singing that you're doing in your head can you talk in this can you talk in the screaming area and scream in the talking area well if you think about it you're just really dealing with pitch is all that's the the analogy that I'm making so if I'm down here you know, it's more like talking or talking quietly, right? As I move up here, you know, you can use any analogy you want, but I'd be talking louder, right? But as I move up here, now I'm, I'm, I think of it more as like a singer singing, 
you know, it doesn't matter if you play aggressively or that's all up to you. But if you think about the, the pitches that you're dealing with, when you come up here, you know, that's where you're yelling at somebody because it's, you know, so you're not really talking anymore. If you wanted to talk, you'd come back in there or, and you can see where they overlap. So there isn't any one particular place to be. It all depends on whether you're seeing the fretboard from this perspective or seeing it from this perspective. If you were in one position, your, your screaming would be here because you don't have anything else, right? And your talking would be here. And your quiet talking or whispering would be down here. But remember, your dynamics also play into that, the way that you're picking these things. So if you're picking it more aggressively, it's going to have more aggression. It's going to sound less like you're whispering and more like you're talking, right? So again, it's just a way of visualizing it in your head. So if I go back to the little wing example that I was telling you, like we do that in a band that I play in. So when we first start that, after I've done the intro and the band comes in, I'm not going to go up and just start screaming at the beginning of that song because I've wasted all my good stuff at that point. I want to start off just building in very gently and very relaxed and start building a mood, right? And as we're playing, you know, maybe I bring it up a little bit or maybe the drummer brings it up a little bit or whatever might happen. You know, now you've got this sort of organic thing that's happening and you start feeding off of each other. You know, uh, it's harder to do that with a jam track, you know, because the jam track you can listen to and then you know exactly where these things are going to be, which is perfectly fine. But it's, it's often different when you're actually playing with other people. But it's a really beautiful thing to learn how to do. But that's how I think about contrast all the way down. So phrasing for me, the big thing with phrasing is listening to the music and then talking or singing in a way that matches that music. So you're not just playing like what happens a lot with players is because they practice rudimentary things like this. When they get in and start soloing, that's exactly what they do when they solo which is where that meandering thing comes in because it breaks up the monotony of just moving up and down, back and forth like that, you see? And with that then, if you think about it, if I took that, that meandering idea, let's say I'm doing this. Which is just an endless supply of notes. But let's say I took that and what I did is I started chopping it into pieces. starts sounding more like music, doesn't it? Okay. Now it might not be exactly what you're looking for, but you can tell the difference versus going. You see what I'm saying? And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that either. Okay. It's not like if you play scalar things, it's, it's a bad thing to do. It's not. It's just with dynamic contrast, if you're going to do that, then do something else that counters that. OK, so phrasing is a really important thing. And the, the, the way to get better at phrasing is you just have to jam with music a lot, whether it's with, a, you know, live human beings or whether it's jam tracks or whatever you got. And what I always tell people is instead of just going out on YouTube or, you know, getting 100 jam tracks or something like that, and then just trying to jam to everything and then feeling awful because it's not working, like you're jamming along with things and it's not working. David and myself and Steve Vai and everybody else on the planet, if we were all being honest, it's not like we can jam to every single thing on the planet perfectly because we can't. We're human, okay? If I'm going to make a video and I'm going to put it out on YouTube, I'm going to find a groove and a key and a tempo and everything else that fits the way I'm feeling that day to make a video. I'm not going to pick something that is feeling horrible <laughs> and then try and make a video on it and then try and release it. You know, we want our best stuff out there. So when you think about someone like, again, it, you can insert any names you want, but I, I think of someone like Tommy Emmanuel, who's one of my favorite acoustic guitar players on the planet, the favorite. And then I think of someone like Steve Vai. Okay. These are two amazing guitar players who are nothing like each other, but they don't wake up every day and go, Oh, I want to be Steve I, or I want to be Tommy Emmanuel. They're just them doing what they do to the best of their ability. 
And so the nice thing about this is, is the more you start adopting that attitude, you start trying to figure out who you are and what your strengths are, not just because somebody told you to, or because again, there's a million players that I wish I could play like, cause I love all these. There's just so many guitar players. I love so much, but I know who I am, but I also know how to feed myself with information, a new lick or a new phrase or a new, you know, thought process by going to the fountain, which is educational stuff, whether it's a book or a video or whatever it might be. And I try and replenish myself by finding new things to, to work on, you see? And that's what kind of keeps me going. My point to this is for you, it's not just about playing up and down inside the position. And then it's not just finding jam tracks and go, well, I, I, that didn't work. And I suck because that didn't work. Maybe it wasn't a bad key for you. Maybe it was a bad tempo for you. Maybe the groove was off for you right? Maybe that groove felt weird. And you're not even thinking about that because you're like, well, it was in A minor and I'm practicing in A minor, but that didn't go well. Well, it's not always you. It might be just the experience that you've had. That groove is something you've never really tried before. And even though all the other parameters line up, that parameter makes a big difference in how it's going to sound when you're playing over the top. So now you have two choices. You can continue working on that and developing your skills over that which absolutely you should do. But you also want to find your safe zone, like Steve Vai or like, again, insert name here. You want to find your safe zone. What key is your key? What tempo is your tempo, right? What groove is your groove? What do you find comfort in? And that's your showcase stuff. Like that's the stuff that, you know, when you have a buddy come over or you're going to do whatever, that's the stuff where you feel at home. That's where you've been building this architecture of your fretboard and all these things we've been talking about. That's where that's coming from. Now you can start building some other thing. Maybe it's the same key, but a different tempo or same key, but a different groove, or maybe it's a different key. See, I love learning things like that. I love jamming with other musicians and going, this song worked great, but that song was a little, little rough for me. You know, I mean, I got through it and whatever, and it was great, but I know here because of the way I feel about myself and the honesty that I have with my playing, I got to work on that a little bit. Like what was going on there? Was I not, what was I not feeling or not seeing or what was going on there that I need to work on? You see? So that's something to think about a little bit. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to move on, but is there any questions about any of this at all? Yeah, it's all clear, Steve. Uh, everybody's loving it, so okay, okay. Keep preaching it. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ryan says, "How important to phrasing is pausing occasionally?" It's very important. Think about dynamic contrast. Here's a really big one: playing and not playing. Okay, stop playing. And uh, thanks for bringing that up because it's a great thing to talk about. There's a difference between pausing and and stopping. Okay, if I do this. <laughs> I haven't stopped. I've paused, but there's been no stop for the listener to go, there was a sentence and there was a sentence. So when you think about playing and you do, you know, Right? You see, there's pauses and there's stops, like there's hard stops. So you hear the phrase and then there's another phrase, okay? It's very important to learn how to think like that when you're playing, so it's not just always playing. Silence is a big part of phrasing. It absolutely is, Andre, it absolutely is. So that's something for you to think about. There's a lot of stuff that goes into dynamic contrast, but the more you think, let me start with this, the less you have the guitar brain and the more you start thinking about interacting with the music, you listen and you respond, okay? You find the flow of the jam track or the band that you're playing with and you really start learning to listen, not just, I learned these things and so I have to force them in here because I was practicing them last week and all these other things. None of that might work in whatever musical situation you're in. You, you can't just rely on all those things. You have to learn how to become part of the music, which oftentimes means you're gonna have to slow down, 
you're going to have to think a little bit more and probably play a little bit less. But the quality of what you're playing is going to elevate. Okay. Now, again, it depends on the style. It depends on the circumstance. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that go into that. But we are talking about soloing right now. So it, with this contrast, sure, it's nice to have some really fast licks or, or whatever it might be if you're into that sort of thing. Um, to be able to build energy. That, that, that's what I love about those kinds of things is that they build energy. But dyna dynamic contrast says, once I've done that, I want to come back again, right? I'm going to build that energy. I'm going to bring this up. But then at some point, I want to come back down again. Okay? So hopefully that, that makes sense to you. So the next thing in here is core chasing, melodic chasing. And again, it doesn't need to be anything really complex. It can be very straightforward. If you were playing over an A minor chord, even if you don't know all of your you know, theory and all those kinds of things, you can visualize this A minor chord, this A minor bar chord, if you know your bar chords, you can visualize that on the fretboard. So you can see the chord sitting right there. You can also see the scale that overlaps it. So what you do is you start seeing these two things overlapping each other. And, you know, some of the notes are the same, which we'll call those, you know, green lights. And then some of the other notes are not the same and we'll call those yellow lights. Doesn't mean you can't play them. Of course you can play them. But the green lights are going to be the ones that you obviously can go to. And if we go back to even square one, it's going to be if you're playing an A minor chord, guess what note you could go to? Well, you could go to an A. As long as you know where your A's are, which I would always recommend learning where your root is in each one of those positions as you're learning them. But if you could visualize this A minor chord, you start thinking, okay, so those notes inside this pentatonic scale or diatonic or whatever you're using, those are the notes that are going to feel like home. So I'm going to move to those. And if I want a little tension, I'm going to go to one of those notes that have a yellow light over that chord. And see, we're not thinking about roots and thirds and fifths and sevenths and all this other stuff, which is great if you do. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But when you're first starting to learn how to do this, you're just giving yourself a direction. That's what you're doing. Okay, I always think of when I teach this stuff, I always tell people fret, fretboard roadmaps is what you're learning how to do. You're learning how to see. The next thing you're doing when you're executing is you're learning how to drive. You're learning how to drive around your fretboard. And now what we're doing with chord connection is we're driving to something. We're driving to the grocery store or the bank or whatever it might be. We're giving ourselves somewhere to go, utilizing phrasing, dynamic contrast, all these different kinds of things. But we're giving ourselves somewhere to go. Now I'm moving to something that connects with the A minor chord. Now, here comes uh, F, okay? So now I've got to think, well, what can I do over an F chord? Okay, well, I might see F down here. Right now, you'll notice that if I play F down here and I was up here, if I only know this one position of A minor pentatonic, I don't see the scale that that exists along with that F bar chord down there. Right. So what can I do? Well, at the very least, I could go from. And I could move down and connect to something that I'm visualizing of that F chord. OK. At the very least, maybe I know the scale that's down there and I could go down there. Maybe you know your cage chording system, which I preach cage stuff all the time. I think it's really important. You might see your F sitting here. And now all of a sudden, you're visualizing your A minor chord as this, and you're visualizing your F chord as this with that framework of the A minor pentatonic or diatonic or whatever it is you're, you're working with. You can see that as well. So now you've kind of got three things happening there. You've got this A minor mm -hmm. and this F and then that scale. So now, okay, so here's it comes A minor. I've got to go to something. Here comes that F. Here comes A minor again. Here comes F right? Or whatever it might be. Okay. Now, again, we don't have a tempo and all this stuff, which would make a difference, right? If I was playing. Okay. Now we got a groove.
There's my F. 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 Here comes F. Sorry, that's F. A. Right? So I'm moving back and forth. That's what I'm thinking about in my head is that A minor and that F. Now, I don't just have to stay here. I can go somewhere else, but you see what it's going to require. It would require me to know that position to be able to move over there. Or if I wanted to stay here, it would require me to know how to see those chords in other positions across the guitar. So the beauty of this is, yes, it, it then shows us what we have to work on. What are we lacking in? And that's not always a bad thing. We don't always want to focus on what we don't know. We also want to elevate what we do know. Like, what can I do? And that's what this conversation is about. But it also starts kind of weeding out some of the things where we look at and go, oh, I can see why it would be important to learn how to do this. Or I would see why it would be important to learn that cage system or this or this or this. Now, again, you don't lock yourself in a room for 12 months just learning the cage system. You keep trying to implement it as you're working on these other things. Because developing that musicality is something that can still happen even though you can't see all your positions of the scale or all the cage positions or whatever it might be, right? You can still develop all these musical elements and still learn those at the same time. However you look at it, you might see it as fortunately or unfortunately. It probably means, though, that you would have to practice a little bit more or diversify what you are practicing, right? I mean, that's kind of how this works. So where are we at here? 342. So we're doing good. Um, okay, so now let's think about licks, patterns, different kinds of things like that. When I was a kid, because I didn't know this, you know, I was self-taught. I, you know, learned how to play by ear, learning songs or whatever, and learned, uh, had a couple lessons with buddies, which I think confused me more than anything. So I didn't have any framework and I didn't understand because there was, again, this, like, like David, this was before the internet existed. And so all you had were, you know, maybe you had guitar magazines and maybe not, depending on, you know, if they sold them in your grocery store or whatever it might be at the time, you had to try and figure this stuff out. And so all I really understood stood was like, I would learn a song, I'd learn a rat song or an Iron Maiden song or whatever, and I'd grab a lick and then I'd learn that lick. And the problem was, is I didn't have this thing I'm talking to you about with this um, kind of membrane of the fretboard moving around and then implementing a lick in wherever I wanted and then coming back into this framework and then moving around and then implementing a lick and then coming back to this framework. All I had were licks. So I had no way of connecting them together. And then if the groove or the tempo didn't match the song that I was learning, it was really hard to make the lick work. Okay. So one thing I want you to think about with licks and patterns and things, and, and to be honest, again, I've been playing so long, I'm sure I play all kinds of different licks, but I don't think of it like that. I'd rather learn some sort of a, what we'll call a pattern or a sequence. And what that is, is a way of moving around the fretboard. So let's, let's just think, for instance, let's say our lick is something real rudimentary. Let's say it's something like this. Let's say that's our lick. That, that's what we've learned how to do. Okay, well, what does that require? Well, we obviously know we'd need to be an A to be able to do that. But more importantly, how are we going to make that fit with the song? Okay, we'd have to be, we, again, we might not know exactly the tempo in our head, like, you know, 128 or something, but we can tap this out and think, like, we'd have to kind of make sure that that'll work in context of the tempo and the groove that the song is that we're playing over. Now, it's very possible to play in free time oftentimes, which we talked about a little bit earlier, but you know, I might just go into the lick and it's not really connecting at all rhythmically to the, the groove and the tempo of the song, and that would be okay. But dynamic contrast says, well, then I got to lock back in because you can, and I'm not trying to be rude at all, but you can tell a player who is not quite at the level that they want to be at when they're not able to connect with the music. And I've always used this analogy. It's like being on the interstate and you're in a car and you're talking and having a conversation and a car comes up next to you. And for whatever reason, they're not passing. So now you're both going down the interstate at the same speed, but you're not connected. 
you're just traveling the same speed, right? These people are having a conversation and these people are having a conversation, but there's no interaction between them, okay? That's what happens a lot when we're not connecting rhythmically and groove-wise to the music. It just sounds like we're kind of playing over the music, and it is okay to do that sometimes, absolutely. But if you do it all the time, it never really sounds like you're connecting to anything, you see? So that's where you have to be careful with licks. So I always think about licks and patterns and things like that is as you're moving around, as you're driving around this fretboard and you get somewhere and maybe you, maybe you get there with intention, but when you get there, you have, okay, I'm going to do this now. So I'm coming up here and that's my lick or whatever it is. Whatever. Right. I'm going to do that when I get here. I'm not going to do that when I'm down here. I might drive there because I want to do that. But to be honest with you, I, I don't think I really do that very much. I think it's more an afterthought as I'm, as I'm driving around and I get there, then I start kind of thinking about what, what I want. Do I want to build this energy with something faster or I just want, You know, do I want something like that that's still got energy, but it's not speed energy, right? Or maybe I don't want any of that. Maybe I just want... something a little more melodic. So now I'm not working on that lick mentality, you see? So that's where I'd be careful with like licks and things like that. If you've got a, an element of framework, one position, two positions, whatever it is, and you need something exciting in there, that's a great time to start learning some licks. Throw something in there. But again, make it work for you. You've established what key you're working in. You've established what tempo is comfortable with you. You've established what groove is comfortable for you. Now you're establishing what licks make sense in your head and in your fingers to add into this as opposed to just randomly you know, grabbing anything that you see on YouTube or wherever it might be. And then you're like, that's what, again, that was my problem is I just had like little bubbles all over the place of information, but I couldn't, I couldn't create cohesion with all of these ideas because I was missing so much of it, which is this membrane I'm talking about, this visualization of the fretboard. I was missing that. So I couldn't make the connection. So the more I started learning about that and really diving in and trying to get more comfortable with that, the easier it was to apply all of these other things. Okay. Um, and then from there, I guess I'll kind of wrap it up with, with this. Once you've established all of that, now we can come back into, you know, this yearning for diatonic or for modes that people have. And again, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, that way, if you've already established yourself with this pentatonic, it's very easy then to throw in a... Throw in some of these other notes that are coming from that diatonic scale to make it sound, you know, more colorful. Because you're adding in this, in the minor's case, we're adding in the, the second and, uh, and the sixth, right? depending on what it is we're doing, but that's a whole other conversation, but I can add those in and that's perfectly fine. Here's one other thing I want to make sure that I leave you with as well. Okay. Well, I always call them vocal tools or vocal elements, hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides, bends, and vibrato. Hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides, bends, and vibrato. Those things, they make, in my opinion, the guitar sound like a guitar. Okay. Without those, we sound like a piano. And there's, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's the ability of being able to bend or slide that kind of adds this flow, right? This elasticity, if you will. whatever it is that you like to do. And so really getting comfortable with bending and vibrato. You know, getting, I know you know what they are, but so often, you know, I would be teaching, I don't do private lessons anymore, but I would be teaching a private lesson and you've got this, this, this student in, in the room and you're jamming together and they would go for, you know, you'd be playing whatever. And of course they're, they're probably already a little bit nervous and they would go for a bend or something. And then, you know, the bend 
wouldn't be in tune. And then they get freaked out in their head, like that guitar brain thing. They get freaked out and now they don't want to do another bend because it went horribly, right? So now they're already inward and they're freaking out and you know all this stuff's going on in their mind. And, and so everything else is kind of a train wreck after that. And it's really important to develop confidence and control in these techniques, whether you're doing a bend or a vibrato or a bend with a vibrato or whatever it might be. And everybody's style is different. But for me, those elements, being able to do a lot of, I grew up, you know, listening to Vi and Satriani and all of those kinds of players. That's, that's, that's what I loved. And they did that stuff all the time to get this more legato kind of feel in their playing, which I very much use in, in my playing. So, you know, you got to pick and choose what you like and what you don't like, but it's very important to think about those kinds of things because they're what give the quality, the unique quality of the guitar versus almost like a saxophone quality. And if you think about it versus just being able to play the notes on the piano, we can bend and manipulate these things in any way you want. Right. That's, what's pretty cool. So you might do a whole step bend. You might do a whole step bend and then go and do a, another half step on top of that. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of really wonderful things that you can do that make the guitar sound more organic versus just the notes that you're playing. Okay. Uh, if there's any questions, I, I could certainly, that's kind of what I have for you to think about. Um, hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. Yeah, Steve, I'm going through the questions. Uh, there's, you covered pretty much everything. Whenever there was a question, you answered it. I thought it was great. Um, and I think the, it kind of uh, gets, it, it kind of joins the idea of, where am I? This one? Yeah, this one. <laughs> it kind of joins <laughs> the idea of yesterday's workshop with Jesse. We were talking about that same thing with different words, but how you'll take a tool like a scale or a mode or whatever it is, and then quickly, as soon as possible, start making music with it. Because there's the, so many of us, um, I, I've experienced that for, for on and off too. We kind of get stuck with a new thing and then um, our fingers kind of take over and we forget that music is from here really before everything or from, from inside. And those tools that we learn, which are cool, we need to have something to do on the guitar uh, that can kind of take over sometimes. And um, I kind of, I kind of smiled when you said uh, you were referring to those musicians that we can we can tell right away that they're not really in with the music, and I think a lot of times that's why too. It's not necessarily that the music is too difficult, but it's because their fingers are taking over and they feel out of control in a way because their fingers are doing the thing. So I I could totally relate. It makes total sense. I'm not. I'm not talking. I'm going to get delayed. That's why I'm not talking. I know, right? You just Do you have it. something to raise your hand? <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So what David's saying is is so true, and and I think that that's the most important thing is is you you all can keep elevating to any level that you want, and again, it all depends on the style. Like I see somebody mentioned about. Um, you know, tapping, or there might be sweeping, and there, there's all kinds of different things that you can do. But think about those. There's specialized techniques that you could use. Now, could you use them in a melodic sense? Of course, you can do whatever you want. But if your focus, like, and I, I'm going to tell this story, and I'm not trying to be rude at all, but there was a, a, a gentleman that used to play in the area where I grew up, great player, and he excelled at sweeping. He was really, really great at sweeping on the guitar. Like, cause that was like the thing back then, but he lacked so many other musical components. So every time it would come to playing a solo, the solo would just be sweeping. Well, that's okay. If the songs require that, right. If the style requires that, then that's perfectly fine. But if you're playing over an ACDC song, there's only so many ACDC songs you want to hear with sweep picking on it. At some point, you might want to hear an ACDC song that actually has a blues scale, right? So I'm not knocking him. What I'm saying is it's hard because we, we have to develop these general fundamental techniques that get us through the musical situations that we find ourselves in. Now, let's be honest. If we were looking at Kerry King from Slayer, I'm going to keep picking on Slayer because I love Slayer, but Kerry King doesn't really probably care that much about melodic blues soloing. And it doesn't matter in his world because what he does is what he does. 
So we have to readjust this box that we're talking about, this, all these parameters, to fit where we want to be in our journey. You know what I mean? Um, I, real quick story. I had a student once that wanted to be a shred guitar player, blah, 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 all these things. So he was learning how to do all this stuff, and he's always banging his head against the wall trying to learn this stuff. And then we started talking about a blue scale because I was trying to teach him how to improvise. And he fell in love with the sound and the feel of a blue scale. And he wound up moving out to Hawaii, which he still lives out there to this day, and plays in bands out there playing blues rock. So he lives out. He's got sandals on every day of his life out there playing music that he loves. But he had no idea until he experienced it and went, I didn't even know this existed. Like I just lived in this musical world and now I felt something different from this. And it was just, it was a cool, it was a cool thing. I still keep in touch with them. Anyway, I'll stop talking. I think that, uh, I'm going to mute you for a sec. Just raise your hand. Uh, yeah. That, I'm so glad you brought this up because I was, I was just about to, uh, to talk about my experience too. So I, I think we have the same similar tastes. I grew up with Iron Maiden, Metallica, all those bands, and uh, then discovered, Sat well, Satriani is the first guy who brought me to guitar. So all those like technical players and things like that. And then I kind of um, really liked at the same time um, some, like I call it fusion, but it's not fusion in the, the like jazz sense, but more like, you know, funk rock with a few of the outside notes, but not like full blown jazz, but always kind of enjoyed that. But I never allowed myself to go there because I thought I needed to have like, a certain set of theory background. Um, why, really, really, it was theory background. I, I did not feel competent in that because in my mind, well, those guys, in order to sound like that, they really need to understand all of those things that I don't get, like, you know, substitutions or, you know, exotic scales, things like that. And I never really allowed myself to, to go there, even though I like the music. But um, once you kind of like get rid of this like preconceived idea that you're not allowed to play that kind of music because you didn't study it, I think that can open doors too. So just like your friend, you know, with the blues, I think it's it's great that you you mentioned that. I guess the main thing to take out of it is um, just like you can get stuck, your fingers can get stuck in patterns. Your mental can also get stuck in a certain way of thinking. Thinking, well, I'm I'm a metal player. I can't I can't do that stuff but it's not true. So I think I, I really like that you mentioned that. That's good. Um, real quick here. I'm going to just comment. Southpaw Bluesman says, I only play with my fingers to, so some techniques are beyond me technically. Uh, it also re reduces my speed, which is limiting. So what I want to say is, you know, I was a Montessori instructor for 14 years. And um, one of the, the philosophies that we have when, when teaching children is that, you need to like the children need to find a way that works. They might be learning from a teacher, but they might be learning from another student or they might be learning from the materials in the room or they might be learning from research that they're doing. The thing about it is, is we're all we're all built different and our approaches are all different. They just are. And so you're exactly right. There are some things, some techniques that are going to be beyond you because of the way that you approach this. But it also means that there's going to be certain things that you're going to be unique to that we with guitar picks are not going to be able to execute exactly the way that you do, right? It, and and it, it's not yay or nay. It doesn't make any difference. It's just embracing that and understanding that about yourself. If you choose to change something about that, that's your choice. And, and say, look, today I'm going to start learning how to play with a pick. But just like my story, like I tell people all the time, like Tommy Emmanuel, which I know David knows him, but it, he's absolutely one of my favorite players. Like when I need inspiration, I, I listen to Tommy. I do not play anything like Tommy. I will never play anything like Tommy. There's not enough time in the day for me to start all over. Like I'm okay doing what I do for a living. But I love his playing. But I also accept the fact that I'm never going to play like Tommy Emmanuel because I'm not willing to you know, give up all the things that I already know how to do to try and commit myself to become this acoustic finger picker. That's not what I'm going to do. You see? So I have to be okay with that on the inside. I have to be all right with the fact that I'm not going to be that. That doesn't mean I can't learn things or whatever, but I'm going to be honest with you. My day, it's hard to get enough time to practice the things that I love in a day already, let alone adding in learning how to play a banjo or learning how to play a trumpet or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I, I love the journey I'm on and I will continue to learn new things all the time. 
But sometimes we just have to face reality of who we are, what our abilities are, what our strengths are, and what we want to do from there. We can continue to strengthen those or we can take a side street and try something new. But we have to be willing to understand that that's going to take it's going to take some some pushing through that wall. Yeah, that, that's very good. That kind of like joins the um, the the story you're telling you're mentioning earlier about Steve Vai waking up and he's not trying to be someone else. He's just Steve. So and same for you. You're you and and so do you. <laughs> um, I think that is great, Steve. Thank you so much for your time. Really means a lot to me and everyone involved. It, I learned a lot. Always inspired seeing you. It was, I'm going to bring you back on. People could deal with a little delay. But thank you so much. Um, if, um, if there's any follow-up questions, everyone just leave them in the chat. I'll, I'll just go through it, and I'll, I'll make sure to answer. You can watch the replay and all that stuff. Um, and, and, and I just, I want, just to want to say super quick, quick thank, thank you, you to David. David. Uh, David is an amazing human being. I, I love David, so I'm glad you're all here and, and supporting what David's doing. He's, he's just a super, super great dude, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you, brother. It means a lot. I'm going to... I know you have a busy day. I'll let you go, and I'm going to stay on for just a little bit. But thanks again, Steve. I'll be in touch. I'll send you a text later. But thank yeah, you, man. No problem. Take care, Take care everybody. everybody. Take care, man. Everyone, thank you so much. This has been, uh, yeah, I, I, I always love listening to Steve, as you, as you know. Check out his videos. If you don't know, you should. But if not, check him out. And uh, this is going to be available as a replay. You can rewatch this. If you're part of the community, um, well, you you know where to find those videos. They are in the community tab. And if you need anything from me, let me know. Also, um, so all of these workshops are free. And for those of you wondering, um, I am not taking advantage of those guys. I paid those guys from my pocket um, to, to teach here. So I'm happy to do that. And if you want to support that and help me offset the cost a little bit, uh, I prepared a bundle for you. There's a link in the description here. And in that bundle, uh, there are three additional workshops, full-length workshops. Those are not live workshops, which is cool because um, they you get an hour workshop that has been edited, so you're only getting the the core teaching stuff with that. So, anyways, check out the the link on in the description of YouTube. You can check that out. And uh, tomorrow we are going to have a session with uh, another friend, Nick Kelly, uh, who. He's an amazing player. Um, Steve was just mentioning sweeping. Um, well, Nick Kelly, is, uh, he, use, he uses economy picking, amongst other things. He's a very accomplished guy and super nice person, too, just like Steve and um, all the guys this week. Um, what was I was going to tell you one more thing. Yeah, he's going to talk about triads tomorrow. So be there, uh, same time, same place, and uh, then... Thursday, we're going to have Sam Bell. Sam Bell is going to talk about creative limitations, setting yourself some limitations in your playing so that you can take those, feel a little bit um, imprisoned with those limitations, but then we're going to move on to something else after that. Anyways, you should be there. And then uh, Friday, I'm going to be running a workshop on um, playing with uh, joy, <laughs> how to find joy in your playing. So we'll talk about that Friday. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day, and I hope to see you tomorrow for uh, Nick Kelly's workshop. I'll see you there.